Bronze of Modern Gods. I'm John, and that's Richard. Hey, Richard. Hi, John. How are you? Okay. Uh, happy 4th of July, everybody, if you're watching this on Monday when it goes live. If not, happy day after or a few days after the 4th of July. <laughs> happy two years from now. Sure, whatever the case may be. <laughs> uh, we've got lots going on again. 25-year uh, rule, underrated books of the week, a little Loki action. Uh, we've got our main topic, which is comic book shipping 101, how to ship your books and not have them arrived like a crumpled up tissue paper. We'll show you how. Actually, Richard will show you how, but we'll get to that after our hot book of the week. Richard, what is it? Our hot book of the week this week is Avengers number eight, the first appearance of Kang the Conqueror. Lots of heat around this book. We get people DMing us. Hey, do you have an Avengers eight? Uh, people are looking for this book. It, it's it's such an attractive cover, Richard. I know you love it. I absolutely hate this cover. <laughs> this cover and the cover for Spider-Man annual, annual number one tie for me the big keys that I just can't have in my collection because they're horrible looking. I think I know what you're saying. They're very static, passive covers. It's like there's a standoff. There's no real action happening. Uh, people are throwing things at a shield or you know at a, at a force field, or Spider Man is just looking at his villains. Oh, they're yeah, all right. is just hanging there. Yeah, and and this cover, the Kang, uh, the Avengers A cover, looks like he has a bunch of tennis balls stuck in front of him. It's it's just a really goofy cover. For a Jack Kirby cover, it is very static. It, it's not the typical Kirby slam bam action. But right. you know, people are betting on a Kang appearance as this Loki series is winding down. Two episodes left as the, as the day we're recording this. And if you're talking about time travel in the Marvel uh, universe, you gotta have Kang. You do. And I, I'm thinking for sure Kang is showing up in the M MCU for ant-man three he's the main villain for ant-man i'm th hoping that the, he's going to do a cameo appearance or maybe maybe a backstory appearance here in the loki series that would be awesome well he's been cast already for ant-man three correct mm -hmm. correct uh jonathan majors has been cast uh to play the role of kang so def definitely he's going to be appearing all right a 9.4 of this book sold in may for ninety five hundred dollars, uh, real strong for, uh, uh, yeah, you know, let's call it what it is—a C list villain like Kang. I mean, nobody gets it. No one gets excited when Kang is the villain. <laughs> yeah, but he's like Diablo. You know, he's one of those villains that yeah, he's been around for a while, but nobody really gives him respect. I'd rather see it Mortis at this point. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Mid-grade copies are strong, too. A 6.0 sold for nearly 2K this month. So even if you've got, like, you know, not the best uh, condition of Avengers 8, uh, supply seems to be not keeping up with the demand for this book. Speaking of supply, Richard, what's the census say? There are 1,824 books on the census, but they thin out towards the top end. There's only four 9.8s out there. All so. right. If you've got a 9.8, now's the time to start you know, rubbing your hands in glee because you're going to see the value go up. If you have a 9.8, you better hold on to that with all the uh, stuff that we talked about last Friday happening, uh, all the investors invading the comic book market. Maybe you can buy that mansion in Bel Air I keep talking about. <laughs> uh, well, if you're going to be buying and selling books, especially if you're going to be selling books like we did, by the way, thanks, everybody, for joining us at our live sale last weekend. It was fantastic. It was phenomenal. We had a great time. Sounds like a lot of you did, too. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for all the, all the really kind comments that we got from people about the show and just being excited, being a part of it. We really enjoyed doing them. We'll do it again soon. And as you'll see, if you purchased anything from us, we know how to ship books. I mean, I'm kind of proud of the way we ship books. Uh, if you're going to sell comic books, you better know how to properly ship them. Nothing is worse, Richard, than getting a damaged box or a crumpled up envelope. And that comic book you had your heart set on that you were waiting to arrive and you're checking the tracking every two hours. It's damaged because someone didn't protect the book properly. And as a seller, you know, you want to protect the 
the book and shipment because if there is a problem, you know, John and I are very, very uh, understanding of issues as they come up and we work with the buyers if something does happen to come up. But you don't want to do that. You want the book to arrive safely and you want the buyer to be happy with their purchase. And to me, that means protecting the book in transit. We're collectors too. We've been on the other side of this. We've gotten, you know, slab. I've gotten slabs that have been shipped in bubble mailers, you know, nothing else. I've gotten uh, hot, what I thought was a high end book shipped to me in an envelope. Here you go. No backing board, nothing. I mean, I, I've got some horror stories. Uh, nothing's worse than a cracked or a damaged slab. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, all these horror stories are what really prompted me to put the together this segment. I have received way too many books. Fortunately, most of them have, have survived okay, but you know, too many books in bubble mailers with one piece of cardboard and the book basically scotch taped to the piece of cardboard. This is nightmare stories. And you go, it's like, well, maybe this the problem is there's a lack of education on how to properly ship a book so that's the purpose of this segment is to provide that education richard's made a really cool video showing the materials you need the proper packing method just to make sure that you never get a complaint from someone if you're selling a book mm -hmm. so richard what do we say uh roll, roll those that beautiful bean footage <laughs> first thing we're going to show you is how i like to package a raw book here I've got a nice J. Scott Campbell Black Cat number one. Love this book, love his art. We're gonna send this off to, uh, to a mythical person. One of the things that I like to use is free packaging materials. So the USPS, US Postal System, provides a lot of packaging materials for free. All you, all you have to do is request it, or you can go onto USPS.com, the website, and you can order it in bulk for free. And that's what I do. I order uh, around 30 or 40 of these at a time um, and I keep them in stock. So whenever I do sales or whatever and I run low, I'll order before I'm out so that I always have stock in. It takes five or six days for it to come in. And the, the pieces that we're going to use here are identified here. This is EP14. This is a Tyvek bag. I love these. I use these both for for um, raw books as well as for slab books because they are waterproof. You can feel them and they're tear proof. You cannot tear these things, you have to cut them. So they're perfect for protecting, acting as a layer to protect your books. And again, they're free. Then I use this on the outside and we'll show you how to use this. This is a legal flat rate envelope. I have found that my local uh, post office does not carry enough of these. You can ask them for three or four, but that's all you're going to get. So you go on the website, you order the legal flat rate envelope, EP14L, and you'll get this envelope. This is perfect for shipping the last piece that we use for shipping material, which is a Gemini mailer. These are absolutely great. If you're shipping comic books, you need to buy these. I buy these a hundred at a time. They end up costing about 70 cents for each one, but they're specifically designed to protect comic books when you ship them. So they're the perfect, perfect package material to act as the base for your shipping efforts. Okay, so the very first thing I do, take the comic book, and I take the Tyvex envelope and slip the comic in. Now, one of my golden rules for packaging is not to use shipping tape on the comic book. Do not put shipping tape anywhere near the comic. If you, if you need to tape the comic, buy yourself a roll of this really inexpensive uh, blue masking tape. Stuff is, will, will hold the piece in, uh, in place without sticking to it and forcing somebody to, to cut the comic book out of your packaging. That is the worst thing you want to do is to force somebody to use a knife to get at your books. So I slid, slid the comic book in and then I fold it over and put a crease in it. Now, if you wanted to, you could take this edge, pull this, there's adhesive here, pull that off and seal it. 
I don't because getting that to open is nearly impossible without cutting it. As I mentioned, it is tear proof. So if I want to secure it, I use a piece of blue painter's tape, fold it down, put it right here. Now, one trick, if you are shipping more than one package, we just did a live sale, I have three packages to ship. The very first thing I do when I get a package sealed is put the person's name on the package. Here, it's not writing. The person's name on the package so that I know through the whole process who this belongs to. Okay, so now we've got the package protected from um, you know, general moisture. Okay, now it's not waterproof, but it's water resistant. The next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna take the Gemini mailer, put the Gemini mailer with the, the Gemini label facing down, and you spin it like this. You fold it this way so that you have this pocket here. Then you take the comic, place it in the center of the mailer, and there is a number of pre-scored spots for the comic book. I'll put it here in the center of those. And then I'll fold each side to protect the comic, okay? Comic now is protected on the sides by the folded parts here uh, of, the, of the mailer. If you want to, you can put another piece of painter's tape across the fold to hold those in place. Finally, you fold the edge one side so that it's, it, it covers your comic and then fold the other side over top. Okay, my wife and I differ on this. She likes this fold on the outside. Me, I like it on the inside like that, whichever you prefer. Now it's not overly important to tape it at this point, but you can. Uh, and at this point, I don't mind putting, putting um, packing tape because we're far enough from the comic put a piece of packing tape over this edge to hold it shut. And the reason why it's not important is we're, the next step that we're going to do is we're going to take the legal envelope and we're going to stuff the Gemini mailer in the legal envelope. It fits perfectly like it was designed for. Okay, so at this point, we've got the comic in here, put the person's name on the outside Again, see, don't forget. We're going to pull that protective strip off. There is a special area here where this folds over. I typically pre-fold and then fold over like that. And we're almost done. I personally do not trust the adhesive that the post office uses. I've never had it fail on me but it's potential to fail. So what I will do, I'll grab, grab a piece of packaging tape, put it over top, just as a final protection. Okay, now this is ready to ship. You're gonna ship it priority mail. This is a legal envelope. It costs $8.50 to ship this anywhere in the country, regardless of weight. That's why I love this. Nice and simple. It provides tracking information. Given the number of layers that you have here, your book is well protected and uh, it should arrive safely. Okay, so that is raw books. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about packaging slabs. Slabs require a little bit better pack or different packaging, I should say. And I typically use more layers for the slabs because they're typically more valuable. And they're also prone to... Um, damage to the case if you don't protect them well. So to protect my, my slabs, again, I use a lot of free shipping material. I use the mailing envelope, the Tyvex mailing envelope that we talked about for raw books. Then I do something called double boxing. That's using two boxes to protect the book. One box inside the other one, kind of like nesting Russian dolls. This box is the inner box. It is 1097 is the code number if you order it off the website. It's slightly smaller than 
the box you typically find at the post office, which is the medium flat rate box. Medium flat rate box you can get from the post office fairly easy, and it is OFRB2. Okay, but if you just search for medium flat rate box, this is what you get. Again, this material is free. You just need to go to the post office and request it. And finally, I like to recycle. So when I get a Gemini mailer, these things are great for sending slabs, and I'll show you how. So the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna take the slab. Oh, I'm sorry, I also have some bubble wrap, which we'll use later on in the process. First thing, we'll take the slab and I put it in one of these bags, the Tyvex bags. Tyvex bag here in this case is here to protect the slab from scratches. So we put it here. I'll grab a piece of blue painter's tape here and put a piece here in the corner just to hold it together. Okay, it's not really structural or anything. It's just to keep those edges together. Okay, the next thing I do, this is what I call the sarcophagus. Okay, I've got this used Gemini mailer. We've got this inner flap here. Well, if we take the inner flap and we rip it off like that, you hold the, keep, keep track of this, we'll use this later. You end up with a piece of cardboard that is perfect for putting around the slab. So you put the slab in the center, fold this end and fold that end, and there you go. You've got a hard protective co co uh, cover for your slab. Now you can use painter's tape here. The problem I find with painter's tape, it's, is the, it, the, it doesn't hold as well against the pressures of the packaging wanting to open. So I usually use a piece of packing tape. Again, we're far enough from the comic, I'm not concerned about that. And this is also easy to open. It's easy to separate to get to your comic. So now we've got yet another layer of protection for your book. Then we grab one of uh, the inner box. This is the mailing box. This is the smaller, the 1097. These boxes are great, easy to put together. Pop those edges, fold that in. There is a side that is taped with a piece of protective covering. Fold that down. That gives you the bottom of the box. The next thing is we've got this bubble wrap. When I save all the bubble wrap that I get from other people shipping me stuff, so I can recycle it and send it to the next person down the chain. So we take the bubble wrap and we put it around the book. Now, the comic is going to fit right into this package. Bubble wrap, again, is there to protect it. Scoot it in. Typically, there's an extra spot space there. I take another piece of bubble wrap and I roll it up and I put that in that extra space. Stuff it in and there you go. Book is not moving. Just do the shake test. You're good. So you take the ends. Fold them down. Take the protective tape off. And seal it. Okay, this is our inner well. This is our inner box. If you're doing a lot of boxes, it helps to put person's name on here so that you remember whose it is. Okay, so we're, we're ready here. The last part that we need to do is pack everything in this medium flat rate box. The flat rate box goes together very similar. It has these flaps. Fold over the non-taped end. Peel the tape end off. We seal one end. Okay, now it's sealed and we've got this, this spot. We put in our 
inner box. It fits in perfectly, except there's just a little bit of room. And you can use this that inner part of the Gemini mailer to slip in here to provide that cushion to fill that spot. Then take these two uh, tabs, fold them in. Take the other tab, peel, and seal. And now you've got double boxed comic within a cardboard inner sarcophagus, which is protected by a Tyvex bag inside of that. So there are a lot of layers to here. Again, I do not trust the adhesive that the, that the post office uses. So on the outer side, what I'll do, take a piece of packing tape, fold it over. I hope you notice how little packing tape that I've used in the process for either the raw books or the graded books. You don't need much. You want to have enough to protect the book, but not enough to make it a challenge to safely remove the book. Okay, so now we've got this ready to go. It gets shipped via uh, USPS medium flat rate, which is eight dollar. Sorry, which is fifteen dollars and fifty cents. Uh, that has tracking information as well. It arrives in two or three days. Perfect. All right, so that's how we pack raw books and how we pack graded books. Richard, good job. I'll buy a book from you. <laughs> well, thank you. I did, did want to add, though, one comment. If you do not have a Gemini mailer handy, and not everybody does, find yourself four stiff pieces of cardboard. The four pieces of cardboard by themselves, not with a book between them, should not bend or flex. They should be, they should be firm. And then put your book in between two sheets on one side and two sheets on the other and protect your book that way. Put the blue tape to hold the book to the to the uh, cardboard so it doesn't move around and use that method instead of the the Gemini mailer. But ser seriously, if you plan on doing any uh, serious selling of books, you need to go and buy some Gemini mailers. And you guys are collectors. You probably get books from CGC all the time. Save those materials. That oh, this yeah. Woman, those cardboard uh, pieces of cardboard that the book is uh, – rubber banded or uh, inside I save all those pieces of cardboard and they're good for extra support I save all the bubble wrap if I only have two or three slabs coming back and they send it in that mailer that folds <laughs> in I save that and I use it to mail slabs you can recycle some of this stuff if you're really looking to uh, pinch some pennies here so oh yeah I'm a hoarder I have a whole section of my basement dedicated to sorry, sorry, sorry you're what <laughs> I'm a hoarder oh hoarder got it <laughs> I have a whole section of my, my basement dedicated to uh, materials that I have gotten that I plan on reusing. And John has an excellent point on the boxes you get from CGC. They are a perfect place. If you're looking to ship books to CGC, I reuse the books they send me. Those boxes are sturdy as all get out. Put your raw books in there and send them back. So definitely save your materials as long as your wife lets you get away with it. You know, I've had some materials saved in the garage for years, years and years. Almost, how, how many years, John? Almost 25 <laughs> years in some cases. Wait, does that mean it's time for the lamest segue to the 25-year world? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> oh, that wasn't so bad. I like that one. You're getting better-ish. Yeah. You, you get a C+. Plus. All right, thanks. Hey, 25-year rule. That's when we look at books that came out 25 years ago, stuff that you may not know about, stuff you may have forgotten about, stuff that is underrated. And the one we're looking at this week, it's an X-Men book, Adventures of the X-Men, number one. Not X-Men Adventures, number one, that based uh -huh. on the animated series. Uh -huh. This is a different series called Adventures of the X-Men. This was another in that series of 99 cent price point books that were aimed primarily at the newsstand market at the time when it was just really dying out. Uh, the X, they did it for Fantastic Four Unplugged. Uh, they did <laughs> Avengers Unplugged. Uh, Untold Tales of Spider Man. Lots of books in this not line of 99 cent books. 
this one is actually pretty cool. It's got this really awesome Dwayne Turner cover with Wolverine versus the Incredible Hulk. Kind of looks like Michael Golden art. This series lasted a bit longer than the rest of the 99 cent line, which kind of died after six or seven issues. This one ran a full 12 issues before, <laughs> before being canned. The last sale for 9.8 was in September of 2020 for a whopping 42 doll hairs. I can't imagine, though, that this would be a plentiful book, especially in high grade. Nobody cared. Nobody saved it. So... If you do find a high-grade copy, hold on to it. Who knows what will happen uh, in another 25 years. years? Well, you never know. The you know Mutants are coming to the MCU. We don't know what storylines uh, Feige is going to pluck from the vast uh, repertoire of stories for the X-Men. So, Who knows? Speaking of storylines that Kevin Feige is plucking out of the ether, it's time for our underrated books of the week. <laughs> Richard, you have one that ties right into Loki. Yes, I had actually picked this book last week. If those those people with sharp ears heard me reference that I had a journey into mystery book pick for that was coming this week. Here it is. Journey into mystery number 32 from 2012. It's 32. 632. Oh, I'm sorry. 632. Definitely a difference. Uh, the first appearance of Thori, who is Kid Loki's pet hellhound. Loki's dog is Thori. He is a hellhound that he kind of adopted. Actually, what happened is he he was responsible for a litter of hellhounds, he, and he was uh, tasked with getting rid of them. He got rid of all the different uh, uh, puppies of the litter, including giving one to Warlock and one to the New Mutants. And there was one left that was uh, vicious and 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 nasty. He saw a little bit of himself in it and decided to keep it for a pet, and that's Thori. Uh, Thori's an interesting, interesting character in, in himself. He is very prolific in the Marvel uh, universe. He ends up being paired with Thor. He ends up being pa paired with uh, Damien Hellstrom. Uh, a variety of different, uh, different characters. He is a very independent character, and he's kind of a comic relief character as well. So you could find raw for this book anywhere from twenty to forty dollars. Um, the census is very, very light. There's only eight books on the census, and the last GPA sale, which was the only GPA GPA sale for a nine point eight, was seventy five dollars. But if something happens where we see this character have a significant role in the last two episodes of the um, the Loki show, you, there may be an opportunity to to make some money on this book. So for, for 20 bucks, it's an inexpensive investment, I think, for a potential payoff in the next couple of weeks. People are already specking on Cosmo for, for Guardians, you know, mm -hmm. the Nova series. So nah, not a bad pick. I don't get the name Thori, though. Why do you call him Thori? Uh, and because of uh, his brother. Okay. I'm All right. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Uh, all right, my book this week is G.I. Joe Special Missions number one. With all the attention on G.I. Joe number one, I think people have really overlooked this spinoff title that came around in 1986. Uh, it's the same creative team that launched G.I. Joe working on this book, Larry Hama and Herb Trimpey. Rhymes with Shrimpy. I'll never forget that. <laughs> it ran for 28 issues. The last sale for a 9.8 was just $140. Uh, I see it still in long boxes, pretty cheap. As G.I. Joe continues to heat up with the Snake Eyes movie coming out and who knows what else is going to happen, it may be just a matter of time before this book gets recognized. G.I. Joe Special Missions number one. Yeah, this is a great pick. I, I remember this book. I have this book in my collection. And... It, it always behooves you to, when you see number ones for popular series, popular characters, to pick it up. You never know when that number one is going to become uh, a hot ticket. I agree. It would be behoovy of you <laughs> to pick it up if you see it. Hey, that's going to do it for us this week. Make sure you uh, subscribe, like, do all that stuff. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bronze and Modern Gods. Visit us on our website. I'll update it. It's the 4th of July. Give me a break. And <laughs> we will see you later this week. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Everybody stay safe.